Hello, hello, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by Inside the Penguins. My name is Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat. And yes, there is still no news stories here on this Monday, but we are still here at the Tip of the Iceberg podcast to discuss everything Pittsburgh Penguins. And there was some news. It was national news. The Penguins really didn't finish well in these awards categories. But three of the NHL's awards were announced since our last episode. The first one was the Jack Adams, which is given to the best head coach in the NHL. Daryl Sutter of the Calgary Flames won that one, which makes a little bit of sense because the Flames won the Pacific Division. They finally got a playoff victory. They didn't show up against the Oilers, but we all expected them to fall at some point, fall apart in the playoffs. Mike Sullivan for the Pittsburgh Penguins finished eighth in that race. The Masterton then given to the player that exhibits perseverance and commitment to the sport of hockey went to Carey Price. I don't think there's any arguments there. I think we all expected Carey Price to probably finish in the top three, most likely win that. Brian Boyle finished eighth for the Pittsburgh Penguins in that one. And then the Selkie goes to Bergeron because doesn't it always go to Patrice Bergeron? But an interesting one here, Penguins didn't finish eighth, but tied for 34th. With one fifth place vote apiece, Sidney Crosby and Evan Rodriguez. How about that? So Horwat, what did you think when you saw all of these results for the awards? I don't think it's surprising that the Penguins didn't finish better in these, but some of them I didn't expect them to finish as bad as they did. Uh, we'll get to the Jack Adams in a second. Yeah. <laughs> the Selkie vote this year, no contest. The Penguins shouldn't have been anywhere near it. This isn't the year where you're throwing away a vote for Tana, Bluger, and Aston Reese, if anybody remembers that. <laughs> yes. Um, they each got a fifth place vote, Rodriguez and uh, and Rodriguez and Crosby. Uh, okay, cool, whatever. I think the most impressive part that is that it was two non Penguin writers. It wasn't mm-hmm. like Rossi or Yoey. It was an Thomas athletic Dr- writer. And it was they, Thomas uh... Drantz and someone from Boston. Yeah. So, cool. Thank you. I guess. I mean, <laughs> I don't hate it. It was just interesting. Um, and then the Masterton, yeah, it, it wasn't going to go to anyone outside of uh, Price or Hayes, I think. Yeah, and Hayes finished, I believe, third in voting for that. Third? My goodness, I thought it was – okay. I can't remember because there was so much. Yeah, but, yeah, it wasn't going to go to anyone outside of those two. And good for Brian Boyle for cracking the top ten of it, I guess. I mean, mm-hmm. it makes sense. Take a year off, have to play way more – sign a PTO, and then have to play way more than you were expected to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's something. That's what the kind of what uh, the middle grounds of Masterton nominees usually do. It's the team's old guy sometimes when there's not really the the storyline there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why Yager was always up for it for some reason. <laughs> and then the Jack Abs, the one where I have a problem. We won't dwell on it too long because I think uh, everyone got their grievances out whenever the nominees were announced. But can mm-hmm. can we stop with the disrespect of uh, Mike Sullivan and the Jack Adams Award? Yeah. Eighth place, fine. You don't want to put him in the top three because Daryl Sutter pulled a no, pulled like a lost at lost at C team into mm-hmm. the playoffs. Their second ever fifty one season. Sure, whatever. Uh, Gerard Gallant, he got carried by a goalie this year. Who was the other yeah. one? Who was the oh, other I don't, one? I don't remember off the top of my head. But this is the seventh season for Mike Sullivan as the head coach. You can make an argument that each season he should have or had a chance to finish higher yeah. than he did in the Jack Adams voting, he's never been a finalist. Especially this season. Especially this season. You could have made the argument. You could have, I was making heavy arguments last season. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, I, I don't know how to put it anymore. Is it just the writers or the, uh, sorry, it's the broadcasters. Yeah. It's the NHL Broadcast Association uh, saying he has Crosby. He doesn't need any more help. He didn't though. He didn't. He, he has Crosby and Malkin. Well, he didn't for a long for a long stretch of the season. He didn't have a fully healthy lineup at all this year. Mm-hmm. We'll digress. All I know is that, uh, yeah, if it was going to go to any one of those three, Daryl Sutter makes the most sense. Mostly because Sutter, like I said, pulled a going nowhere team into the playoffs. Very, doing it very well. Dragon was carried by a goalie, and I don't remember the third name, so that should say enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure who that third one is off the top of my head. I don't have it in front of me here. But with Sullivan, listen, 
he didn't have Crosby for the first couple of the games of the season. He didn't have Malkin for the first two months of the season. And that is uh, pretty similar to the only Pittsburgh Penguins head coach to ever win the Jack Adams. And that was Dan Bilesma back in 2010-11, where both Crosby and Malkin missed significant amounts of time. Let's talk about Jeff Carter, because it doesn't seem like he's going anywhere. Signed a two-year, $3.125 million extension in the midst of last season, and he has a no-move clause. For what? Off the top of it, what are you doing with Jeff Carter? I guess you're keeping him around, right? Because you kind of have to. For all intents and purposes, Jeff Carter wasn't hasn't been a bad penguin with us. He's been a little inconsistent toward the end, but he's performed in the playoffs, both playoffs, both minor playoff stretches that he's been in here. He's played fairly decently. Um, and he's putting up rel- a relatively good number of points. It's not something you could say that he's you can't say he's bad. That's for sure. He's been fine. Mm-hmm. It's just very interesting the way uh, we just had to keep him around. We had to give him those extra years uh, post-retirement thoughts from him. You know, I mean, 45 points in 76 games on paper doesn't sound terrible, especially if you say, hey, that guy is also 37 years old. Mm-hmm. You go, okay, yeah, that's productive. It's the inconsistency that came with the end of the season for me, but – I, I always feel in the middle ground with this one because mm-hmm. he's older. He, we see the production declining, but he's at the same time still performing fair enough for a third line center position here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I look at this contract signing, obviously we've all cried nepotism a little bit. We all know that he is not really the kin of Ron Hextall, but we all cry nepotism a little bit because of, the former connections between Hextall and Carter, both of them, of course, products of the Philadelphia Flyers organization, both of them spending time and winning Stanley Cups in the LA Kings organization. But still, when you look at it, I can I can see why Hextall would want to sign a center before this summer, because if you look at the free agent center market, it's not really that attractive. And I know Jeff Carter had some points this year where he looked god awful. I'm not gonna, I'm not yeah. gonna mince words about it. There were times where he was clearly the worst center on this team and that includes a player like brian boyle who is older than him and slower than him but there were also times where he was an integral and pivotal piece to this roster it's just a matter of the fact that you know he's not going to be that consistent force he's going to give you really good games he's also going to give you really bad games the one thing that he's most consistent at is the face-off circle, which is very important, especially for a bottom six forward and a bottom six center. But at the same time, when you look at that, you have to ask, even though his best quality is face-offs, you have to ask, would he be a better fit as a winger on this team? You know, I, I would think so. Didn't we try that for a minute? Like, I just he has to played. Remember. Yeah, he, he did play a couple of times as a winger this season. Specifically, he played on the second line with Evgeny Malkin at times because that was the added face-off ability that Carter had in case Malkin was in a tough spot on the face-off. But also, if you don't remember, when he first came over, there's that inside the paint, not inside the Penguins, Penn's inside scoop or, or whatever, in the room clip of him talking to McCann in his first practice and saying, hey, are you more comfortable at wing or at center? And he's like, I can play both, but I've been playing a lot of wing lately because he was playing on the wing in LA before they traded him here. So he's clearly comfortable at both positions. And if you get somebody else to play that center position, I don't know, maybe a guy like Philip Hollander, maybe if you bring back Evan Rodriguez and get those guys at the center position and get Carter in a more comfortable spot on the wing, you can always transfer him back, but maybe he will be more comfortable as a winger. There's nothing wrong with having too many centers, right? Correct. All you do, because that was one thing of, I think it was, the, was a weird Mike Sullivan year where he wanted two, almost two centers on every line. So if <laughs> someone got kicked out of the faceoff thought, well, you have another one. Mm-hmm. I think that's a perfect situation for Jeff Carter. Stick him on the wing. He becomes that backup center on the line or the first one and then switch spots, which is another thing Mike Sullivan's huge on doing. Mm-hmm. It's not a totally awful idea. Again, if that's what he's really best for, sure, I guess. Because, again, you look at the numbers and you say, all right, that's not terrible. Yeah. It's 
just a hard situation because again, he's older and it's good that he is at least aware that he's comfortable on the wing. I mean, he played wing in LA. Yeah. That was the sign of the times. He was an old man. Every old man hockey player starts playing wings. Just every old man center starts playing wings because the young centers coming up being faster, taking the job. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whereas here uh, we'll get to the discussion. I like Teddy Bluger. I just, I mean, that uh, that jump's got to come, man. That jump has to enter quickly to be a third-line center to me. Yeah, when looking at Carter as well, I think the fact that he's older, and you mentioned it right there, I'm glad you did, that when players get older, a lot of the times, especially if they were a center a long time, they transfer over to become a winger. Because Mario did it. It was exactly, a yeah. different situation. I mean, they formed one of the most lethal lines in hockey, but yeah. it, he did it to yeah. help the team. And here's the thing with Carter, too. If you look at the actual position and the responsibilities of center versus wing, and I know a lot of people are like, they're not that different, but there is a lot less responsibilities as a winger, specifically in Mike Sullivan's system. Defensively, there's a lot less responsibilities for wingers than there are for centers. So if you're going to be able to go out and make him a winger and give him less responsibility, maybe you don't see as many valleys as we saw in the 2021-22 season. Maybe he's able to play a little bit more consistently because there's not as much thrust upon his shoulders as if he were to be the third line center. Or, I mean, we, we don't know as of right now, he technically slots in as the second line center on this team. Yeah, that's even that's the scarier part. He's a, he's a good player. It was not fun watching him be second line center. Uh, earlier in the season as a matter of fact if he wasn't he could have been first no Jeff Carter's one that got hurt that's why we had first line center Evan Rodriguez because we thought it was gonna be Teddy Bluger which could have been hysterical but Evan Rodriguez was funnier and I don't know it's these are guys you don't want going down Jeff Carter's can you can you can rely on Jeff Carter for a game or two here and there to play second line center but not a whole season so that's another reason to make the Evgeny Malkin signing a little more important am I right yeah yeah the the Malkin or just some other second line center like if the Penguins can't bring back Malkin which right now to me and this is just gut feeling I feel like he's coming back I I really do I I I don't think that they're not going to be able to get a deal done with Evgeny Malkin Latang I'm a little let more wary of but they're not going to be able to roll out what they have in the organization right now for center depth. They're going to need to bring either Malkin back or somebody else in, because if Jeff Carter's the second line center, I'm I'm I might be premature here, but I'm axing the Penguins chances of doing anything of, of actual relevance next year in the postseason. Uh, you would have to see who they get in, I guess. Yeah. Who, who fills in where, if it does go Crosby, Carter, Luger, somebody, maybe there's question marks or maybe it's, Crosby, somebody, Carter, Bluger. Well, that's a little better. It already sounds a little better. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, I'm out here placing orders on things that uh, I don't like normally placing orders on, and that is uh, our lineup and what lines they want. Mike Sullivan tries to not do that either until it becomes blatantly obvious that your I was first about to line say. is your first line, yeah. your second line is your second line, that maybe maybe third, and your third line might get deployed less than the fourth line. So I don't know. It's – it's fun stuff to talk about, though, because this offseason has been boring, kind of boring so far. But <laughs> It's only been two and a half weeks. Yeah, the season's weeks still going on. Yeah, it's been three weeks, actually, to the day. Oh, my God, time is dragging then. <laughs> yeah. These playoffs have been wild then. That being said, that being said, I don't, I, Jeff Carter's a fine player. It would yeah. be much better if he could be the fourth line center. It would yeah. be. And that's honestly, that's where I think he's best utilized. I I think we'll get into the the Teddy Bluger discussion in the second segment of the show and whether or not he can make that jump. But I I think he is, and we'll get to it. But when you look at Carter, even if you put him at that fourth line center and something happens to Malkin or whoever else you have at 2C, Carter can fill in in a pinch. He can play second line center for a handful of games and that'll be fine. But realistically, I think he's perfectly typecast for the Matt Cullen role on this team. And I know that it gets annoying and I know that it gets frustrating when all we do is go back to those Stanley cup teams and try to repeat the formula. But that is ideally what you want your 37 year old center to be is the fourth liner, not the third liner, not the second liner for Christ's sakes. You want him to be that four C that has the ability to move up. If you need somebody with that kind of veteran presence, And I think that's perfect for a guy like Jeff Carter because 
he was great in small sample sizes. But as we said so many times in this segment, he just ran out of gas at points. And when he ran out of gas, it looked like a beat up 1980s Honda Civic or whatever it is. It did not look good when he ran out of gas. So the best part, we had tried to keep him moving along there. The idiot light might be on for those of you who that are old enough to remember what the idiot light was. The idiot light might be on, but you got to keep him with some gas in the tank. The best move to me is put him at fourth line center, but I also don't hate the idea of him at wing. No, I don't hate it either. Uh, because you're right. We do try and keep rebuilding these, these cup teams. We've been tr- every time we sign a third line center, every time since it happened, it's been, is this the Nick Benino replacement? Is yeah. this the Nick Benino replacement? Is this the, no, we have to find somebody new mm-hmm. because there's only one Nick Benino in this world. It's just the way it is. Can you, can you find someone who plays the same way and can get the same kind of production? Sure. But don't call him Nick Benino, call him by his name. Mm-hmm. To, like every signing we've had, Mark Jankowski, Nick Bukestad, it, we've been attempting to make them him, and it's not working. Then we now we have this fourth liner, which is Jeff Carter, trying to be the, the Matt Cullen. Every time we sign a fourth line, old guy, Patrick Marlowe, now Jeff Carter. Brian Boyle. The, Brian Boyle. Same team, but yeah, it's is this the Matt Cullen of this of this era? No, it's not. I mean, he's an old guy, yes. First of all, Jeff Carter is going to produce way more than Matt Cullen. Mm-hmm. Let's just be honest. Matt Cullen shouldn't have returned. I will die on that hill. Mm-hmm. And now it's he's here, and he's here to stay. So if you want to typecast him as the father of the team, because that's what we love doing, mm-hmm. which I don't, but whatever, <laughs> it's go for it. Go mm-hmm. for it, because he's probably going to be here to stay at that age. And now it's just a matter of him producing. If he can keep doing that, sure, play the wing. Perfect. This is just getting smarter and better if you can have Jeff Carter on your wing as opposed to on center because, like we said before, he's hitting that age where you have to take a step back in your mm-hmm. role. You're fine to keep taking face-offs. You're fine to keep killing penalties or, t- or uh, yeah, the, yeah, whatever you need to do. You just take got to take the step back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's going to be that second line penalty killing center, which is fine because he is great at faceoffs, and him and Bluger create a really good one two punch on the penalty kill and the faceoff dot. So I like that about him. There are a lot of downfalls. There are a lot of times this season, as we said, where he looked really bad, but there were times this season that the Penguins would not have had quite as much success if they didn't have Jeff Carter in the lineup. Let's talk about Teddy Bluger a little bit. Basically, this episode is all circumferencing around, that's not the right word, all encompassing around the bottom six centers. Circumferencing, what is this, geometry? Uh, But let's talk about Teddy Bluger and whether or not we believe he's going to be able to make the jump from fourth line center to third line center. Because personally, I wrote a story about it on a, a, a sub stack that nobody read. But I wrote a story on it like eight, not eight months ago, like five months ago, because time is very, very slow right now. But like five months ago, I said, you know what? He should move to third line center before the season had even ended, before the playoffs had started. And now I continue to believe that Teddy Bluger is best served as this team's third line center heading into next season. It is a jump, but I think it's one that I he's probably ready for. It's a small jump that you do have to at some point make. Maybe this is just the time. Like the numbers don't replicate him making that jump yet i mean like i had mentioned there's uh let me find the points again there we go jeff carter who just finished off his season with 45 points in uh 19 goals and 26 assists which is pretty good again we keep mentioning his age that's good for a 37 year old jumping down to teddy bluger who in 65 games who in fewer games mind you Mm -hmm. Uh, nine goals and 19 assists, which for 20 points, which if I'm not mistaken, is all career highs. Uh, the, the nine goals ties ties. I yes. think he did it two other times with nine goals. But One other 28... time. Oh, okay. But yeah. But the 28 points is, is definitely a career high for him. Yes, it is. Cause it's a career high in assists tied for a career high in goals. So he crushed his career high in points by his crushed by his standards, at least by six points. Mm-hmm. But I think really what's, most impressive of what will lend my hand into saying, yeah, bump him up to the third line centers. I know we don't talk about the stat a lot uh, because it's normally a throwaway stat, but that plus minus, he was a plus 12. Mm -hmm. He was a plus 12. 
Now, again, it's not the greatest. I mean, it's not Brian Dumoulin's plus 24. How did he get that to lead look this at, team? Look at who he's playing with. Uh, sure, but he was uh, he also had 15 assists. Brian Dumoulin had a quiet good year until the end. That being said, we're talking about Teddy Bluger. Yeah. In, uh, six, in the 65 games, he became a plus 12. That's also a new career high. Again, we're not taking much into this discussion, but the fact that he's on the ice and goals are happening for a fourth liner? Yes. That means he's not giving up any either. Mm-hmm. Really. I mean, uh, we know that's the name of his game. We know yeah. this. But that's just impressive stuff to actually look at. And when you sit, when you see, he realizes he's the fourth line center. Okay. He has a plus 12 rating. Well, how? How is the fourth line scoring 12 goals, let alone them not giving <laughs> any up? Yeah. Well, he's got a defensive style of play. So moving that to the third line could be quite fun. Mm-hmm. It's all of a sudden your shutdown lines, the third line, you're giving them a lot more minutes and that you're shutting down opposing offenses a little more often. And now it's just a matter of line matching who in against in this league are Bluger enter name here, enter name here going against. Well, and I think that's the most important part. Enter name here and enter name here are not going to be guys like Brian Boyle, who was pretty good offensively but still not what you get from a third liner. Right. Those names are not going to be Dominic Simone and Zach Aston Reese, two players that Bluger did play the majority of the season with. Brock McGinn, same thing. He played the majority of the season with McGinn. These are not guys, despite though, like McGinn had a decent offensive start to the season. These are not guys that play on the third line routinely. These are not guys that fit the typecast of a third liner on the wing routinely if you get him players that can finish because you mentioned the name of his game he doesn't allow many mm-hmm. goals when he's on the ice and that's at five on five and that's on the the top penalty kill unit for a penalty kill that finished what fourth in the national hockey league this season something that's, like that yes so that's important there not only the fact that he's great defensively but the reason that his numbers are so good and Jesse Marshall tells us this every time he comes on the show. It's the same thing as Zach Aston Reese and, and Brandon Tanev when he was on that line. These guys play in the offensive zone. They yeah. don't stay in the defensive zone and are great at blocking shots or get sticks and lanes very well. He's good at that. But it's the fact that they get into the offensive zone. They forecheck hard when they don't have the puck. And when they do, he cycles very effectively. Now imagine if he has a trigger man that can actually bury a shot. That's why one of his best seasons offensively when we started to realize that he was doing really good offensively was when he played with Brandon Tanev when Brandon Tanev's shooting percentage was off the charts. Tanev had a great offensive season that lended us to seeing, oh, Teddy Bluger can be a facilitator. Oh, Teddy Bluger can cycle the puck really well. Oh, Teddy Bluger has a pretty decent finish when he's playing with players that are also playing well offensively. Give him that opportunity is what I'm looking for. Give him the opportunity to play with a guy like Danton Heinen, a guy like Evan Rodriguez for extended periods of time. Maybe even a guy like Kasperi Kapanen. It will improve his numbers. I guarantee you he will score 10 goals for the first time in his career. I guarantee you he will once again have a career high in points if he is deployed the correct way on that third line with guys that can actually score. And I also think if that happens, his defensive numbers will just get that much better. You want a trigger man for him? Yes, we I just do. Talked, we just talked about him. Jeff Carter. Hey. Move him to the wing. Suddenly, he becomes an even better goal scorer because we know he can do that. He has not, he had 19 goals last year. He was almost a 20-goal guy. Remember when he scored five in a game? Four in a game? Whatever it was? Four? Yeah. Four. Four, four goal game against Buffalo. Whatever it was. Who cares if it was against Buffalo? Remember when he did that? Mm-hmm. He, he, put him on the wing with Teddy Bluger and just, just see what happens. I don't yeah. know. Because we keep talking about wanting to move Jeff Carter to the wing. And if Ron Hextall is a little a little stuck up on keeping his boy around because again, it probably was, I don't think we didn't even say this when Jeff Carter got here, it probably was the protection from the uh, expansion draft and the promise of a new ish contract. If he wanted it. Yeah. That brought him here in the first place. We may not have him had it not been for those for Ron Hextall, a protection and a new contract. Those three things we may not have had. We may have been finding somebody else, Mm -hmm. but he's here. This is what we got. So, the fact that we didn't even talk about that is at least a good sign, right? We're not mm-hmm. mad at the contract, really. It's just kind of his play. Yeah. I think because we realize he's, we're stuck. Um, <laughs> but if we're going to have him, and if Ron Hextall is going to, you know, be persistent about playing him and mm-hmm. 
keeping him maybe in a third line role somewhere. Move him to the wing with a Teddy Bluger type, who we all do believe can take the offensive jump eventually. Mm-hmm. And if it happens, it's going to happen this year at the age of 28. 28. It's, it'll happen this year. Mm-hmm. That's his offensive jump year at the age of 28. So it's time for him to get a third line center position. Stick him on a wing with the veteran winger, or stick, yeah, give him a winger who's a veteran winger and Jeff Carter who can teach him the way a little. You have your mm-hmm. two centers still on the same line again. This is looking good. And then you fill in the other the other line mate with enter name here. I don't know what side it'd be, but it's two two names in my opinion that would fit really well there. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head if Kapanen plays the right side. I think he does. But if Kapanen comes back, I would I would love to see Kapanen in a bottom six role this year. And having him on a wing with Bluger and, you know, you say Carter. I still think Carter is best off as a fourth line center. You know who I want to see on that other wing? I want to see Valtteri Pust in it. Yeah, I really it, do. Yeah, we want to see the young guys at some point get their chances too. But here's the thing. The whole point of this conversation is Teddy Bluger. And if he has any of those three guys on his line, like if that line is made up of the two of those three guys and him, he's going to do well. I would put his ceiling, and this is just my opinion, and you can quote it if you want to. You can old takes expose it if you want to, if he doesn't come anywhere near these numbers. If he is deployed as the third line center with line mates like Pustinen and Kapanen, I have Teddy Bluger ceiling at 15 goals, 40 points next season. If he's healthy and he plays with those guys consistently. 40 points. Uh, you know what? I don't hate that. I don't hate that. He does have to be that third line. He does have to get the ice time in the minutes. Yep. Um, and he just has to find the back of the net. There has to be a little consistency. His linemates have to be consistent. All things have to go right, but I could totally see it. That's why I'm saying ceiling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I can see it. And it's not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, this guy's it's what, a 12-point bump, and it's a six-goal bump. And whenever you're considering the fact that he's going to be playing with much better scoring players and the fact that he's probably going to get more ice time, despite the fact that he's still the Penguins' top penalty killer now. It, it was him and Aston Reese hand-in-hand. Hand. Now it is for sure Teddy Bluger. I think he could do that. And I honestly believe that if, if he makes that jump, it's only good for the Penguins because then you have that flexibility with Carter. Do you need somebody to go up on the second line Well, for injuries? Sure, Carter. Do you need somebody for a third-line winger? Sure, Carter. Do you need somebody who should be the fourth-line center? Yeah, Carter, and that's all made possible by giving Teddy Bluger that opportunity to make that jump and and genuinely, listen, if he's not ready for it, he's not ready for it. But all the indications that I've seen the last couple of seasons are that he is ready to make that jump to third-line center. And when you have nobody better right now, like who, who else is going to be there? Evan Rodriguez, Jeff Carter for another full season. Hollander's barely making the roster, let alone going up and playing 3C. So I think Teddy Bluger is the best fit for third-line center as of right now for the Pittsburgh Penguins, unless they go out and they sign somebody. But again, they got issues at second line center, let alone third. I think Bluger is the answer for three C. You might just have to be, I mean, just who are some of the upcoming centers guys that we don't want guys that are retiring guys that we've already discussed that. Yeah. uh, Just might not fit here. You'd have to come up with something decent. I mean, just looking at the top salaries of upcoming free agents, there's also not a ton available. Yeah. I think part of that may just be because a lot of guys had to this past year with COVID and money issues. A lot of guys uh, had to take smaller contracts. And I think that was a big, that's been a big common theme these last two years. It's just these smaller deals that people don't have a choice, but to sign Mm -hmm. for what it's worth. It's healthy for uh, cap constraint stuff. You know, it's fun seeing a guy like, Nola Chari, who's really good, but he's only making not a ton of money. Like yeah, Nola Chari is like picture perfect fourth line center in the NHL. Yeah, and hey, he's a free agent now. Oh well, yeah, he's on Florida, right? Yeah, Florida free yeah. agent now. So you can fill the roles. You mm-hmm. absolutely can. You can fill it with guys that aren't in the system if you really wanted to. It's just we're getting out of the pandemic hockey stuff. And everyone's gaining more money, and now people are start requesting more money again because mm-hmm. that was the path a lot of these names took. It was take a year or two on a small deal, cash the hell out. Yeah. Guess what? That's what I. This off season, I know the last two off seasons were small contracts to bet on yourself because a COVID, b 
weird era of hockey where it's in a transition phase, it seems. Mm -hmm. And then your cash out year. I think we're hitting it's either this season or next season. We're hitting cash out years. Mm -hmm. And it's Johnny G watching those contracts hit is going to be horrifying, especially once that salary cap rises. Yeah. Those we're then at that point, we're definitely out of it. And it is cash out year for everybody and their mother because the the hockey teams will have space. Mm-hmm. The Penguins have a little bit of space right now. They have priorities, but they have a little bit of space. It might, but we may not have enough to fill from the outside. It may have to be mm-hmm. from the inside. And for what it's worth, it should be from the inside. We want to see what these guys yeah. can do. We've been hyping up this 29th ranked farm team for for <laughs> ages now. Let's see it work. We have a handful of guys, and they're all almost ready. That's the thing. Because <laughs> if you look beneath that layer. It looks pretty bad. You know, it looks like the upside down in Stranger Things. It's a little little sketchy once you get underneath that top layer there. But nonetheless, I mean, you look at guys, names that I've heard. Let's just say that. Names that I've heard. Sure. Not from insiders, not from sources. Just names that I have heard around the water cooler. Max Domi. Eh. Fun. Okay. Max Domi. Okay. Like, they're, Vinny Trocek. All right. Better than Max that Domi. I like that one. I like Vinny Trocheck. I that Pittsburgh guy. There's a lot of check marks that he, he crosses off, but still, for the price, are do you want Vince Trocheck as your second line center? I don't know. I don't really know. And if, if that's the case, then you still have this question between Carter Bluger, third line center. I like Domi is a three C. If you get Domi as your two C, I'll probably be crying into the corner behind me because like I love Max Domi. I do. I really like him. But his trajectory has not only leveled off, but just plummeted. Because when he was in Montreal, let's let's face it, he was looking like, I wouldn't say as high as Cole Caulfield's ceiling, but he was looking on a similar trajectory. But now, just doesn't look like the same player. But like that's what I mean. The players like that, it's going to be a tough offseason to fill that second line center role. So why would the Penguins make it any more difficult and have Carter as your 3C when you could really make everything a lot easier to give Bluger that extra bump and put him at 3C. I, I think that's the best thing for the Penguins. I don't know if they'll agree. We'll see uh, in, what, two months, whenever training camp starts. But that that's really what I believe would be best for the Penguins is Bluger at 3C. It would be. And, like, especially if you move Carter to the wing. Yeah. Beyond that, if you have to keep if you have to keep Carter at center, fine. Then you have Bluger at four, fine. It, it, again, the, as long as the wheels keep turning – and then if the production swaps, sw- swap them. Don't <laughs> yeah. be afraid to swap them. Uh, all I know is if we have to sign a center, by God, make it a young one. By God, make it a young one. Yeah, and I don't – listen, I loved Brian Boyle, but – Not even that. Brian doesn't... Boyle's a unicorn because he yeah. was also very talented offensively for a guy that is that old and that big. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong. We love Crosby in this town. We love Malkin in this town. Jeff Carter's been fine. All three of those names – are over the age of 35, or at least they yeah. will be. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. I think Sid's 34. I he's going to be 35. He's going to yeah. be 35 this year. All three of those names are over the age of 35. Mm-hmm. Listen, don't get me wrong. They can all still perform. But it's just, when you look at it on paper, and let's, sometimes this is a paper league, you look at that and you go, that's horrifying. Yeah. Like, what is this, the 08 Red Wings? or the later Red Wings, where they're holding on to all of their 40-year-olds. Yeah, the t- t- 2011. Yeah, the 2011 <laughs> when they started. Wings, it's This is so not ideal. So for if you have to sign a center, by God, make it a young one. I kind of I, I kind of don't care who it is, <laughs> as uh, I try and glance at names. A- anyone under the age of 30 would be a good start. Yeah. Also, stay away from Claude Giroux, please. Please. <laughs> Just, I know that's that, that's on your wish list to not get. Just genuinely, it doesn't seem like it would actually happen. Like I, I know guys have crossed that party line before. That's a very extreme example if it happens. Yeah, even the even when the when it happened with Rick Tockett, it didn't seem that extreme because he was only just named captain, I think. And it's a little different when, I mean, let's be honest, the Flyers owned the Penguins back then, at least for the last 15 years here. It's been a back-and-forth rivalry. Yeah, with and he was the face of that franchise for a decade. Yeah, so that it would, that one would be a little different. It would yeah. be a little different. No, thank you. I don't care how many bridges might be intact. 
Uh, could you have – those fan bases would lose their minds. I get that also Ron Hextall, another one that crossed party lines, but we're well aware of the – that that one didn't end well. We all know that one. Yeah. So – if you want to see our visual puzzlement to trying to count up the age of Sidney Crosby from 87 to 20 to 2022, you can check us out on YouTube where full episodes of the tip of the iceberg podcast, plus shorter five to 10 minute snippets are all available. And there will be a lot more coming at inside the penguins on YouTube, where you can find all full episodes of tip of the iceberg. Podcast. You can watch me spill coffee all over myself too. Th- that too. I that tried was... to finish that without laughing, but beautiful timing. I'm glad I have a, that sweater on over my very nice shirt. There you go. Because Horwad is heading out to play golf today. Yes, Lucky sir. you. But let's finish off this episode with our weekly pens poll. We asked, and this one is not about the pens, really. We asked, which remaining team in the Stanley Cup playoffs do you want to see win it all? I think we have an answer. A pretty unanimous answer from Pittsburgh Penguins Twitter. 72% say the Colorado Avalanche, the next closest. 13%. For the Edmonton Oilers, 12% for the Hurricanes slash Rangers because last Monday was, of course, prior to Game 7 of that series. So 12% said either the Canes or the Rangers, and only 3% want to see a three-peat from the Tampa Bay Lightning. Horwat, at this point now, the Colorado Avalanche have a commanding 3 to nothing series lead on the Oilers. They could end it in 12 hours at this point is when game time is for game number four between Avs and Oilers. And then, of course, the Rangers lost in game three, making it a two to one series lead for New York. Who do you want to see win it all for the Stanley Cup in 2022? Colorado. Easy answer. Okay. We got Crosby's buddy. We have the story of Nazem Kadri. We have a Colorado team that got over the hump. And you know what happens with teams that get over the hump? Mm -hmm. Ball game. And they're showing it. The thing about Edmonton is if anyone, if anyone, it's going to pull off the reverse sweep. It is Connor McDavid himself. I'm not yeah. saying it's going to happen. I'm saying if anyone is going to pull off that four game comeback, it's going to be him playing mm-hmm. every position. Yeah. So if honestly, if Edmonton takes one or two, I would not be surprised. Honestly, I would, I, I, would e- I wouldn't either just because one Connor McDavid is just an absolute freak of nature maniac. this 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 postseason. Also, because despite the goals he allowed were were awful, they were bad in game three. Mike Smith stood on his head for the majority of that game. It's just the goals that he allowed were awful. Like it's weird. It's a weird dichotomy whenever you play that good and allow goals that are that bad. But still. The Oilers, I, I wouldn't say they have a chance just simply because Leon Dreisaitl's health. I mean, he looks like yeah. a guy that is literally getting the puck, turning his back and saying, please don't hit me hard. Please don't hit me hard. Please don't hit me hard. And then he bumps off of somebody and he says, okay, I'm just going to just skate around here and, and hope that I can make something happen. He is not explosive enough. Like he, he's still ridiculous. He has, I think, 28 points in this postseason, but he's just not healthy. And you could see that in game three. And I don't think they're going to have enough to take it from the the avalanche, even though the Habs are going to be without, you know, Nazem Kadri, Darcy Kemper, Andre Burakovsky, uh, one of their defensemen as well. But nonetheless, I, I also think the avalanche are the team that I would like to see win it. In the East, I would much rather see the Lightning, and it's not because the Rangers took out the Penguins, because what Shesterkin has done, despite the flopping, like, get that out of his game, and he's really turned it on against the Hurricanes and specifically against the Lightning. He has been unstoppable. It's been fun to see. I love seeing Mika Zibanejad have success. Didn't like it in Game 6 and Game 7 against the Penguins, right. but I've loved watching it since then. But I really want to see the Lightning do it just because it's the same thing with Alabama. They won their first one, and I was like, cool, it's Alabama, whatever. They won their second one, I'm like, all right, that's okay. They won their third one, I'm like, that's a little annoying. And at some point, it's like, let's see how far they can do this. And and that's what I want to see for the Lightning. Now, the big thing with the Lightning is no Braden point. I think that is really costing them. People are saying, oh, they played too much hockey. They really haven't. They had seven days off between their last series and this one. It's not that. They're not cooked. It's the fact that Brandon Hagel is not Blake Coleman. Nick Paul is not Barkley Goodrow. Uh, Ross Colton has been great in stepping into that role, similar Mm -hmm. to what we just talked about with Bluger stepping up. But he is not Yanni Gord, and Braden yeah. Point being out is a massive, massive loss. That's what hurt them in games one and two. That's what hurt him in game three. That's going to hurt him the whole way 
until they either get point back. They're not getting the third line back, but until they get point back. So it's going to be a, a struggle for them more so than it has in the past. But if I had to put my money on anybody, I'm putting it on the Avalanche, which is great because that's the team I want to see win. Yeah, absolutely. The Avalanche is a fun, the fun team. Like I said, if anyone's going to come back against the Rio, it's going to be Connor McDavid and the Oilers. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned the Rangers or Hurricanes. Hurricanes would have been fine. Uh, I don't. I just don't know. Something yeah. soured me in the Hurricanes over the last few weeks. I don't know why. I think maybe just they're inconsistent as all hell. And then there's ye old New York Rangers. Uh, no, please no, please God no. I get sometimes guys get pride about losing to the champion. Not no. in this case. I mean, sometimes that- people. People really do. It's, hey, you know what? They went on to win it all. What are we supposed to do about it? We were just in their way. Uh, but when it comes to Tampa Bay, hey, no one can be better than us. No one can top that. No one can yeah. top the, the, the back-to-back in this era, okay? No one's allowed to. So <laughs> if it t- I'm not saying if it takes the Rangers. No, I think a, a battered lightning against what could be a rested avalanche could be a ton of fun. Yeah. Uh, but – I just think it's the Avalanche's year, man. And also, if Connor McDavid does pull off this reverse sweep, give him the constant immediately. Just don't even. Oh my start. god, yeah. Just the four puck drop of game one. We'd like to present the constant right now. We yeah. already know does how it, this is going to go. It does not matter how this ends. Here you go, buddy. Yes. Um. Yeah. So it it, it it's going to be interesting down the stretch. I finally, in recent uh, days and recent weeks, finally started restart restarted watching hockey again. Yeah, uh, you had to because, take your, your your little sabbatical after the Penguins loss. Most players do. I just yeah. I needed my turn, and it I was kind of just waiting for the Rangers to get knocked out. Yeah, but uh, you've been and, enjoying Pirates baseball. I've done the opposite. I've just started to dip my toe back into Pirates baseball now because I was so laser focused on the NHL and NBA playoffs. Yo, who hasn't been enjoying Pirate baseball right now? What is going? We're going to screw around and win something. They're going to screw around and make that last playoff spot now that the playoffs are expanded, which I don't think is going to actually happen. But they might win 70 games, which to me would be a success. Yeah, we might screw around and have a winning season. Um, uh, that being said, though, uh, what was I about to say? Oh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I was, I've been waiting for the Rangers to get knocked out because you have to you have to remember this. Whenever they entered the series against the uh, Lightning, they had only played one game against a full-time starting goalie. And that one game... He was hobbled. Yeah. Uh, I saw, and, and I held on to that because, yeah, they played Anti Ranta in round two. He's not a, he's not their starting goalie. Let's just be honest. Frederick Anderson is, is up for the Vesna. Yeah. He's not their starting goalie. And that wasn't the Anti Ranta that we saw in the first round against the Bruins. That was a much, much worse Anti Ranta. But see, here's the thing. If they beat Vasilevsky, oh, that, and then, sh- that shuts everybody up because yeah. guess what? That's, that's the that's, best. Yeah, because that was one thing. That was my argument in my head going into that into game one, and then they peppered him, and I went, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to say it's two games now and hope for the best for the rest. And, oh, oh, okay, the, they're winning the series. So uh, go Lightning, just please beat the Rangers. I don't want to see the Rangers keep winning. I'm only watching West Coast hockey, so I'm tired. Um, yeah. And if we're going to close out the show, small news update from the Penguins. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I just got a text from my boss about this. I see their tweet now. The Penguins, together with their ownership group at Fenway Sports Group, have selected OVG360, the full-time service venue management of Oakview Group, to manage, book, and operate PPG Paints Arena. So now Fenway out here putting in their own crews, I mean, they, or at least their own selections, into PPG Paints Arena. Mm-hmm. Hey, the, the new ownership group is taking over. Yeah, they're, they're putting their stamp on the Pittsburgh Penguins quite effectively as we will expect to see more of stuff like that throughout the NHL offseason and the Pittsburgh Penguins offseason. But, all right, Fenway, I didn't know what you you had there. It wasn't anything major, me. yeah. I was That's getting what... excited. I was like, oh, did they sign somebody? Did they fire somebody? Which would have been even more I, fun. If it, was a big, if it was a big thing, I would have stopped our segment. That's why I kind of said at the end. We could just yeah. close with it. Fair enough. But, and it uh, is just Fenway leaving their stamp. Fair enough. That's going to do it for this episode of the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. We'll be back on Thursday with a new episode talking all sorts of Pittsburgh Penguins stuff, even if there isn't any actual news. That's what we do. We come back consistently and we talk your ear off. So if you're joining us, we thank you and we will see you on Thursday. Have a great week, Pens fans. (laughs) 